Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our service this week. Uh, I hope that you've had a good week uh, and that you can uh, be present with us as we worship even in our own homes. This week, Ross is uh, again playing music for a hymn and we have Sandra uh, taking our reading and leading us in prayer. And Gordon's got a lesson for us from the story of David and Goliath. Let's worship God together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading. And now we sing together, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, creator and sustainer of life, in these times when our lives have changed so rapidly, we turn to you, our unchanging and unchangeable God. Thank you that you have promised to be our rock and our fortress. Lord Jesus, our saviour and redeemer, as we face times of anxiety and uncertainty, we turn to you, secure in the knowledge of your love for us, grateful that you are the same yesterday, today and forever. Holy Spirit, our guide and our comforter, in these times of isolation, we turn to you, our constant companion, filling our lives with light and love. We thank you for the beauty of your creation, for the warmth and the light of the sun, for the rain which brings growth, for the hills and the seas, for the bird song, for the colour and variety of plants, flowers and trees. Most of all, we thank you for each other, for friends, for family, for fellowship. Thank you that you know us and yet still you love us. Forgive us for the times when we have been too concerned with ourselves to acknowledge you, too worried about our own lives to notice and care for the needs of others. 
Help us to walk more closely with you each day. We join together in the words that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the story of David and Goliath. The army of Israel were at war with the army of the Philistines. They met for battle in a big valley, but the Philistine army had a soldier called Goliath who came out each day to challenge them to fight. He said that they should send out one person to fight him, and if that person won the fight, then all the Philistines would be their slaves. But if Goliath won, then all the people from the army of Israel would be the Philistine slaves. The problem was that Goliath was a big guy. In fact, he was almost nine feet tall. His weapons were bigger than anyone else's and all the men in the army of Israel were afraid to fight him. David was a shepherd looking after the sheep on his dad's farm. One day, his dad asked him to travel to where the army was camped to take some food to his older brothers who were part of the army. When David arrived at the camp, he saw the Philistine army and heard about what Goliath was saying and he became angry that he was insulting God and his people. He went to see the king, who was called Saul, and told him that he would fight Goliath. At first, King Saul said, don't be silly, you're just a boy and Goliath has been a fighter for his whole life. But David said, when I look after my dad's sheep, sometimes lions and bears will attack the flock and I have to fight them off. God has always helped me do that and he will help me defeat this cheeky Philistine. So the king agreed and sent for his armour so that David could wear it when he fought Goliath. But it was too big and David could hardly move when he had it on. David decided he was going to trust God as he had always done, so he went down to the stream and got five smooth stones to use with his sling. When Goliath came out to challenge someone from the army of Israel to fight him, David went out to meet him. Goliath just laughed at David and said, Am I a dog that you send me a stick? He did not think much of David, but David said to him, you come to me with sword, spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Then David put a stone in his sling, swung it round and round and shot it at Goliath. It hit Goliath right in the head and he fell down dead. The armies of the Philistines panicked and ran away and the army of Israel chased them and defeated them. David had won, not because he was bigger and stronger than Goliath, we know that he wasn't, but he won because he trusted God. Good morning. I don't know about you, but uh, I really love the Avengers films. I don't know if you've seen any of them. My Really, my favourite one is called Avengers Assemble. But one of my other favourites is a film called Thor Ragnarok. Now here's Thor here, can you see him? Now he, part of this film, my favourite part of this film, is when Thor's in this big arena and he has to fight someone. He doesn't know who it's going to be and he's standing waiting in this arena. It's full of people, there's loads and loads, hundreds and thousands of people all watching, waiting to see what's going to happen in this big fight. And suddenly the door's burst open, they go flying off the hinges and in comes his opponent and it turns out to be, well you already know this if you've seen the film, it's Hulk, here he is. And at first Thor's really happy because Hulk's one of his friends from back on Earth because you know they're on a different planet now. And uh, But it turns out that they've got to fight anyway because Hulk goes really crazy and they have to end up fighting. 
But when I look at that fight, when I watch it, it makes me kind of think of David and Goliath, the story we've just heard, because look how small Thor is compared to how big giant guy uh, Hulk is. Now, David and Goliath is a great story. It's one of my favourites. And because it's always good to see someone small defeating a big mean guy like Goliath. But how did David ever beat Goliath? He wasn't bigger than him. He wasn't a better fighter. He wasn't better at weapons. It doesn't make sense that a young guy like David could beat a big scary guy like Goliath. But David did one thing that helped him to defeat Goliath and that was he trusted God. In the past, when David had been looking after his dad's sheep, God had always helped him to defend the sheep from the wild animals that came to attack them. So David grew to trust God because God had always been trustworthy. So he knew that when he came to fight Goliath, he could trust God to help him do that. Now the army of Israel could not save itself. They had a big problem and they couldn't solve it. But God could and he sent David to save that army and help him to defeat Goliath and give them that victory. Now I wonder if that makes you think of someone else. We had a big problem because we couldn't be friends with God because of the wrong things we did separated us from God. But God loved us and he sent Jesus. And because of what Jesus did, we can now be friends with God and we can know that God is with us all the time, just like David. Now, did you notice that God didn't prevent David from having to fight Goliath? But he showed David that he'd be with him in all the difficulties that he had. Now, our world is very strange at the moment. We can't see our friends, we can't see our family, we can't go where we want to go. And that's difficult for us, just like David had his difficulties. But we can also know that if we trust God, he's going to help us. David found that God had always been trustworthy. And that gave him the confidence to trust God in whatever situation he was in. And the same is true for us through Jesus. Well, thanks everyone. And I hope you have a great week. Take care. A reading is from Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to 29. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Those descriptions of the Lord Jesus in our readings these weeks from Revelation, they've been quite overwhelming. The one who holds the seven stars, the first, the last, who has the sharp two-edged sword. And this week, eh, we heard him described with eyes 
like flames of fire and feet like burnished bronze. Well, they're supposed to be overwhelming. They are uh, images taken from human monarchy. This is how human uh, monarchy works. Magnificent palaces, elevated thrones, shining crowns and luxurious robes. The whole image is cultivated to overwhelm. The one who inhabits, who uh, wears uh, these symbols, has authority and power. The risen Lord Jesus Christ has ultimate authority. All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me, he said. In these passages, we are shown a vision of his overwhelming authority. The church of Jesus Christ is his church. He is the king and head of the church and he has this uh, overwhelming authority. The church of Jesus Christ derives an authority from him. This is a vision for his church. In each passage, this Lord Jesus Christ, who has this authority, tells his church, I know. In the passage today, he tells us what he knows of his church. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. Those works which the Lord Jesus Christ knows of his church are love, faith, service and patient endurance. Love is the head, the key to all Christian living, the source from which the life of the church flows. Love for God and love for others. In scripture we read that God is love. And so when we in our lives display works of love, we are displaying in our lives the very nature and character of God. The goal held before us, the vision for the church, is that we love as he first loved us. Faith here is belief and trust. The works of faith are those things we do because of what we believe. We pray because we believe God hears and answers our prayers. We read the Bible because we believe in it, eh, we read God's word. We care for the world around us because we believe it has been created by God and continues to be loved by him. We share the good news of Jesus with others because we believe it is good news for us and we believe it is good news for them also. We cannot diminish faith to some intellectual list of propositions with which we agree. Faith transforms what we do every moment of every day. Service and patient endurance go hand in hand. We serve others because God has chosen us. We are elect for service. We serve today, tomorrow and every other day after that. And that's why service goes with patient endurance. It would be easy to give up. I served yesterday. Why should I do it again today? I want to do something new and different. This is how the Lord Jesus Christ wants to know his church. Love, faith, service and patient endurance. Is this how he knows us? This is his vision for his church. In the next verse, the risen Lord Jesus tells his church that there's something he's not pleased to know. Something he has a knowledge of which he holds against his church. Something he longs to see changed. I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. The temptation when reading a verse like this or, or talking about a verse like this it is to hear a condemnation of specific areas of sin. Sexual immorality and, and worshipping idols are mentioned. However, the verse is using these two examples of sin to illustrate two categories of sin. Sexual immorality is a vivid example of not loving others and not loving ourselves. Sexual immorality is self-harm. 
Sexual immorality breaks families and communities. There's hardly a better example of not loving others. Murder, stealing, lying, coveting, those Ten Commandment verses about loving others, which include sexual immorality, are examples of not loving others. Idol worship, here illustrated by eating food offered to idols, is the public example of not loving God. It goes with denying the existence of God, abusing his name, not uh, giving time to know the presence of God in your life, Sabbath. Those Ten Commandment verses about loving God. If we focus on the specifics, if we spend all our time talking about eating food to idols or sexual immorality, we miss the point. The church is tolerating teaching which does not encourage love for others and love for God. We could perhaps paraphrase these verse, this verse. I have this against you. You tolerate people who are teaching you not to love others and who are teaching you not to love God. You are following this harmful and false teaching. Your duty as you listen to this talk, as you listen to or read any Christian teaching, is to discern. Does this teaching lead me into loving God? Does this teaching encourage me to love my neighbour and to love myself? That's godly teaching. If it doesn't do these things, then don't tolerate it. Seek out teaching which grows in us the likeness of Christ. Love for God, love for others, love for self. The passage concludes in verses 26 and 27 with the risen Lord Jesus saying something about authority. The one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. What does this have to do with loving God and loving neighbour? That's what we've been talking about. Love, faith, service, patient, endurance. Not tolerating teaching that lead us away from these things. What does this talk of authority have to do with loving God and loving neighbour? Well, let's work backwards. The Lord Jesus has received authority from his Father. The authority of the King in God's kingdom. The Lord Jesus has exercised this kingly authority in his sacrificial death in his glorious resurrection, in his sending the Spirit, in his loving you and me. The Lord Jesus has shown great faithfulness to his promises. He has exercised gracious service towards us, patient endurance with us. That's how he has used the authority he was given. The rod of iron and the earthen pot in verse 27 are quotes from Psalm 2. These are standard poetic images for kingly authority. The images of an authority which cannot be denied. The Lord Jesus Christ uses his undeniable authority to love and to serve. To make grace and mercy known among us. He has received ultimate authority, all authority in heaven and on earth from his Father and he uses his authority to bless. First to bless the church, and then through the church to bless all peoples. It is only by this route we can enter into the end of verse 26. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. What kind of authority does the church have over the nations? The one who conquers is the church, the disciples of Jesus, those who love and serve. To love God and love others. The Church of Jesus Christ does not have authority to crush or destroy, to wound or harm. The authority given to the Church is derived from the Lord. An authority to love and to serve. An authority against which no enemy nor any other power can stand. An unstoppable authority. As Jesus exercises his authority in love and grace, so he calls his church 
to receive from him an authority of our own to exercise love and grace. Love, faith, service and patient endurance, love for God, love for neighbour, love for self. We need authority to live in this way. All authority has been given to the Lord Jesus and from him we derive an authority to be used in his service, to be expressed in our love-filled lives. This vision for the church turns out to be a vision of authority turned on its head. Not a self-serving, dominating authority, but a loving others, grace-filled, mercy-sharing authority. Doesn't that sound like a church which will transform the world? Isn't this a vision of the kind of church that you want to be part of? A church which does what Jesus is doing. A church which follows her king into his ways of love and service. This is the only kind of church there is. And we are all called by King Jesus to be in his church. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your powerful words to us and pray that you would help us to hear them and to know them in our lives. Yet work among us that our lives might display your love for God, your love for neighbour in all that we do and say. Bless us in this, we pray, for your glory. Amen. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us through your Son. We thank you that you are a caring God, that you bring rest to the weary and light to those living in darkness. In these dark times, Lord, we thank you that the numbers being admitted to hospital and the numbers dying are going down. And we pray for those in government faced with tough decisions about how and when to allow more freedom. Guide them in all their deliberations. We pray for the medical staff and scientists who are advising them. We pray for those most affected by the current crisis, thinking in particular of those working in hospitals and care homes. Keep them safe and strengthen them when they feel weak or overwhelmed. We pray for those grieving or anxious about loved ones in hospital. May they know your comfort and love surrounding them. And we pray too, Lord, for those worried about jobs and financial hardship in the months to come. We ask that the money being released by government would get to those most in need. Father, we bring before you those closest to us, our family, our friends, our church. We pray for those who are worried, those who are grieving, those who are ill, those who are lonely. May you be comfort and strength to all in this time of need. We bring these prayers to you in the precious name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you for watching and sharing in our service today. I, I hope you found it helpful uh, to worship with us. Do remember our prayer ministry. You can email us any prayer requests you have and our prayer team uh, are ready to pray for you and for any in need of prayer. Let's share our benediction together. Let us go in the light of the resurrection of Jesus our Lord and the blessing of our one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all today and always. Amen.